All right, last time in the Zoom call, we talked about the Mino, okay? And we looked at this discussion between Socrates and Mino about what virtue is and whether virtue can be taught. Okay, and in the course of the discussion, there is an incident that's very famous, and I mentioned it in the Zoom call, where the uh, slave boy is brought in. He is unable to solve a math problem. It's basically just a geometry problem, and he's asked to find a square that is twice the size and area of this particular square. And the answer is, well, you draw three other squares, and then you take the diagonal of each, and the square in the middle is actually twice the size and area of the original square. Okay, and the slave boy is unable to solve this problem initially. Uh, in fact, he gives wrong answers, flat out, uh, initially. Okay, but by means of Socratic questioning, in the course of the dialogue, he moves from a state of being unable to solve the problem to being able to solve the problem. And the question is, how did he do that? How did he get there? How did he accomplish that? And the answer that uh, I suggested, the answer that I favor, uh, is that the slave boy had jumbled experiences from earlier in his life that Socrates' questions enabled him to organize and systematically to connect together with each other. Okay, He had seen shapes. He didn't know how these shapes were connected, but Socrates' questions enabled him to organize his experiences. Okay, that's potentially one answer. That's not Plato's answer. Plato's answer is that what happens is the slave boy recollects knowledge that he once had, but that he lost when his mind or soul became entrapped in the body. Okay, and Plato's view is that we had a pre-bodily existence. Now, let's set that view aside and let's look at just a part of that view, which is more legitimate, and that is that our minds come prepackaged with certain forms of knowledge. Okay, uh, so we're going to set aside the whole pre bodily existence prior to this life existence thing. We're going to instead look at uh, just a part of that view, which is that our minds come into the world prepackaged with knowledge. Okay, and there are two schools of thought in the history of philosophy on this topic. Okay, we are talking about the, uh, a topic within epistemology. Epistemology is a word uh, meant to designate a field, uh, a field about the study of knowledge. Epistemology just means the study of knowledge. Okay, what can I know? What are the limits of my knowledge? What is the scope of my knowledge? What can I trust as truth? Um, can I, uh, can I trust my senses? Those sorts of questions are asked in epistemology. Okay, and there are two schools of thought on the question of uh, the mind and its prepackaged ideas. One school of thought is called empiricism. And the other school of thought is called rationalism. Okay, empiricism is a school of thought held by a bunch of famous philosophers. One philosopher who's the founding father intellectually of America, John Locke, was an empiricist. Okay, and empiricists say everything in your mind, all the thoughts that you think, all the ideas that you have arose, all of that arose out of your senses. In other words, everything in your mind is a, come on in. Thing in your mind is a function of your sensory experiences. <coughs> Nothing in your mind is there prior to your senses. It all results from your senses. Okay, so the empiricists think that we don't have innate ideas. We don't have minds that are structured prior to experience in a way that uh, can be classified as, as pre-experiential knowledge. Okay, let me go ahead and mention this now. Everybody take your cell phones, okay, and put your phones out in front of you on the table face down. And let's just get into the habit of this right now in this class. Please don't touch your phones for the rest of the class period. Can you borrow uh, some physical notes from somebody? 
I'm sorry, man, I'd love for you to take notes on your device. It's just once people open the devices, you know, like you never know what they're doing. And I don't, I don't think you're doing anything, but you know, it's just like it, one thing leads to another is the way it works. So, okay. So yeah, just borrow, borrow something from somebody. And next time just bring some, bring some physical notes like that. Okay. All right. Um, rationalism is the other school of thought here. And on rationalism, our minds do have innate ideas. They come into the world prepackaged with certain ways of thinking. And those ways of thinking are simply true within the mind. Okay, so um, let me illustrate this for just a second. Uh, we don't see the numbers of mathematics anywhere in the world. Instead, they are ideas that we humans have. You don't see the number 7 or the number 12 anywhere in the world. According to the rationalists, mathematics as such is not something that necessarily exists in the world. It is instead something that exists in your mind. And when you say 12 minus 7 is 5, you are saying a truth that is true in your mind. But we don't know whether it is true in the world or not. Because we don't know whether, in fact, for all we can tell, mathematics doesn't exist in the world. We don't know whether mathematics is a thing in the world. Now, this doesn't, this isn't to say that the world doesn't function in accordance with mathematical principles, because it quite clearly does. But those are principles that we are extracting from the world. They aren't in the world itself. Nowhere in the world is there an equation 12 minus 7 equals 5. It is rather something that is true in our heads. And the rationalists say this is evidence of prepackaged ideas. Our minds are structured so as to make mathematics true. It's not necessarily evidence that um, mathematics is something that exists out there in the world as such. Okay, now these two schools of thought, we will visit them later in the semester. Descartes, one of the thinkers we will study, was a rationalist. Hume, David Hume, another thinker we will study, was an empiricist. I just want to introduce these ideas as a wrap-up to the Mino from last week. Um, and just to just to get the ball rolling uh, so that we can continue to think about epistemology throughout the rest of the semester. Are there any questions about that or more generally about the Mino as a dialogue? Everybody good with that? Good. Okay. Um, I see I do not have an eraser here. There's an eraser over there? Oh, yeah, I could have used a paper towel. Eh, oh well, who cares? <laughs> <laughs> I guess if I do this enough, I'll get chalk poisoning, but you know, I'm, I'm joking. I don't know that that's a thing. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, pull out your texts. Okay, we're going to be covering the Fido today. <laughs> it's on your phone? Oh, okay, okay. Huh. Okay, that's a problem. Um, for today, just follow along, and I'll, I'll think about what to do about that going forward, okay? Yours is on your laptop. Laptops are okay. Laptops I'm, I'm good with. So if you guys want to take notes on your laptops, I'm okay with that. Okay, it is the phones that are the problem. Look, guys, I am, t as well, like you, I am a fellow sufferer of phone addiction. Um... I become anxious when I am separated from my phone. Uh, and so, you know, I, I'm just one sufferer telling other sufferers where to find some temporary relief from addiction. <laughs> um, if you find yourself getting anxious like I do when you parted from your device for a while, that's probably the sign that you have a problem. You know, and the first step to getting help is to admit you have a problem, isn't it? Yeah, right? So, okay, all right, let's move on. Okay, the Fido. Um, the Fido is, on, on, in my book, uh, the Five Dialogues book, it's on page 93. I think I have the same edition as most of you. Um, this is a dialogue that takes place in Socrates' last days, his last day. And uh, it's after the ship, uh, 
has returned from Belos and he's been condemned to death. These are false charges, trumped up political charges. Uh, the two charges, recall, were um, corrupting the youth and dishonoring the gods. Okay, and he's uh, he's been condemned to drink hemlock. So he's got to uh, drink this poison. That's the form of execution that's been chosen. And Socrates is surrounded with his disciples here on his last day, and they're talking about death. Okay, and Socrates' uh, disciples, his followers, are all real concerned because they think this is the end. And Socrates is not so convinced. He thinks that his soul is going to live on. He thinks his soul is immortal. And he thinks he's got good arguments for the immortality of the soul. And that's what the Phaedo is about. It's a dialogue about the immortality of the soul. Okay, it's a dialogue about whether some aspect of humans continues to be after our deaths. Okay, so um, we are going to get into some of those arguments, and we are going to talk about whether there's some aspect of humans that continues to be after our deaths. But I first want to do a little bit of background philosophy and some just intuitive discussion so that we can uh, all be on the same page and get to get to understand a little bit more about what is at stake in this dialogue and what's what precisely is going on philosophically. The Phaedo, yeah. So I'm going to put it up here. The Phaedo, yeah. And uh, what's your name, by the way? Zaire. Zaire, that's right, from the Zoom call. Yeah, good to have you, man. What events do you do on track? Uh, I do okay, that's cool, that's cool. I ran track, but uh, long distance stuff. So different side of track than you. Yeah. But I did steeple and uh, yeah, 1500 and the five. The steeple was, that was crazy, man. That was crazy. So that's the one where they all like jump over the water and like over the barriers for the rest of you. Um, but uh, it's a dangerous race, man. Cause like guys get spiked going over the barriers. We were the Christians, so we never spiked anybody, but, um, <laughs> but man, some of those guys from those other schools, all those, those pagan schools, boy. Um, okay, all right, let's move on. <laughs> okay, so um, let's do a background uh, discussion philosophically to the Phaedo. Okay, um, Socrates thinks that his soul will live on after his death. But I want to ask, first of all, a question of you guys. And maybe that'll help us understand what's going on here. Do you think you have a soul? By a soul, I mean some non-physical aspect of us that's like a conscious self an experiential you know, self that can't just be reduced to a physical explanation. Do you think you have a soul? Mm -hmm. You sure? Um, I can see this uh, desk here, and uh, I can see that lectern there, and I can see the table that, cell, uh, that you guys on the front row are sitting at. But you know what? I can't see your souls. You sure you got them? How do you know you got it if you can't see it? If I can't see it, if others can't see it, how do you know you got it? It's like the wind. That is actually precisely what Plato says. That's very good, yeah. So Plato thinks that we have souls. He thinks that it's not something that can be seen directly, though. He thinks it is like the wind. You can see the wind by its effects. Rustles the leaves, you feel it against your skin, etc. So also Plato thinks that you can see the soul by its effects. Okay, um, you see me moving my arm. My soul, my conscious self, we'll call that the soul. My conscious self right now is telling me to move my arm, telling my arm to move. Okay, you don't see my soul doing that, but you see the effects. And Plato said, that's evidence for the existence of the soul. Well, is it? Uh, 
Let us add a question to this question, do you have a soul? We're going to add another question. Let's just go real deep right away. What is a human being? Okay, and in response to this question, there have been two major schools of thought down through the centuries. <coughs> One is a school of thought that we can call dualism. <coughs> dualism says a human being is two things simultaneously, a soul and a body. Plato was a dualist. Most people intuitively, unreflectively, before they think about it, they are dualists. We are two things simultaneously. We are a package deal, a soul and a body on the dualist view. The soul inhabits the body. The soul tells the body what to do. And these two parts of the human, the soul and the body, impact each other on the dualist view. So the soul quite clearly impacts the body. My mind tells my arm to move. My arm moves. Soul impacts the body. But the body impacts the soul. You study in for that test late at night. But you're just so sleepy. You can't stay awake. Or you're hungry. You gotta go get those Oreos. Your body is undermining the ability of your soul to do clear thinking. Okay, or, or you know that guy in the row in front of you is just so cute, so it's hard to concentrate on the lecture. Okay, or whatever the, the, uh, whatever the impact of the body upon the soul might be. Okay, so on the dualist view, we are two things simultaneously, souls and bodies, and these two things both influence each other. Let me pause and ask if there are questions or comments so far. You guys agree with the dualist view? Good question. So um, on the Greek view, there are two parts to the human, the soul and body. Sometimes in Christian circles, you will hear soul and spirit distinguished from each other. All I mean by soul for the purposes of this discussion is a conscious part of you, some sort of non-physical conscious self. Whether we have, besides some sort of conscious self, some sort of um, spiritual element to us is not something that I feel qualified to say. So I'm a Christian, but I'm not sure that the spirit language in the New Testament is intended to be evidence that there is a third component to humans. Yeah, I'll put it that way. I'll put it that way. Um, I definitely do think I have a soul. Um, so as a Christian, I think I've got a soul, but um, I'm not sure if there's some spirit that is different than the soul that's in me. That uh, And you hear it, you, you, when you read the New Testament, uh, you see verses about uh, dividing soul and spirit and things like that. It's not clear precisely whether that's intended to convey uh, some really, ex really existing division or whether it's just rhetorical. Well, what's the difference between the soul and the spirit? Well, that's what I'm saying is uh, I, I don't know that there is one. Yeah, I'm not sure that there is one. For the purposes of this discussion, I'm assuming that there's just one non-physical aspect to us. Um, okay, so uh, what's the difference between you and the table you're sitting at. What's the chief difference between you and the table you're sitting at? Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. You know you exist and it doesn't know it exists. Absolutely. You know that it's there and it doesn't know you're there. And dualists say, look, this is clear evidence that there is an aspect of us that can't just be reduced to physical particles and explained in terms of physical materials. Okay, now, there are problems with the dualist view. Okay, big problems. Let me mention one. The interaction problem. 
This is probably the chief problem with the dual cube. So some skeptic might say, okay, so you are two things, soul and body. And these two things are different from each other, although packaged together. How do they interact? So for instance, my mind right now is telling my arm to move. And my arm is moving. And uh, if I were hooked up to uh, electrodes, some researchers could see the neural pathways in my brain lighting up. These neural pathways lead to uh, various nerve impulses. The nerve impulses stimulate the musculoskeletal structure. The muscles lift the bone. The arm moves. Okay, and a, a scientist could tell a story about how the, um, the electrical impulses uh, get transferred down through the, um, the nerve endings to stimulate the muscles. But you know what the scientist is not doing? Scientist is not explaining the first person sensation that I am having as a conscious being when my arm is moving. Instead, the scientist is explaining some sort of external perspective, a third person view of the physical things that are happening for my arm to move. Where the science stops is that conscious experience the what it is to be on the inside, as it were, when your arm is moving. That's where the science stops and is unable to adequately explain what is going on. Okay, um, if you're having trouble with this, think of it in terms of the two words that we use to describe different aspects of, of, uh, of what's going on in our skulls, um, mind and brain. One word, the connotation is from the inside, as it were, the first person conscious experience of the mind. The other, the connotation is the external scientific perspective, the third person view, the brain. Okay, but the what it is to be on the inside when your arm is moving is a very different kind of thing experientially than seeing somebody else's arm move. Okay, when you move your arm, I don't feel it. You feel it. Okay, and that suggests that there is some aspect of you that's not reducible just to the physical. But the question is, how does that aspect of you that is not physical somehow link up to the physical, insert itself into the world of the physical, and get the arm to move? Okay, so I can move my arm, but I cannot move that table unless I use my arm to move the table. I cannot, with my mind, make the table move. There's something about my mind that connects up to the physical that is my arm that can make the physical, it can insert itself into the physical and make the physical move. But my mind cannot connect to that physical thing and make that physical thing levitate. Okay, without you know, my arm being the intermediary. So what is that magical connection point? How is it possible for this non-physical thing that is the mind, if the mind exists, the conscious being the soul, if there is this non-physical part of us, how is it possible for that to interact with the physical world? Um, again, just to change up the uh, illustration, um, if you're a ghost, right, you can't open the door because you're not physical. You're just going to pass through the door. If there is a non-physical thing to us, the soul, how does the soul end up opening the door? By telling the arm what to do. How does that happen? And the interaction problem is something that we are nowhere near explaining. It's something that we probably won't ever be able to explain. Certainly our current science is not capable of explaining how we can go from a first person thought, move the arm to the arm moving. Okay, the interaction problem is a major problem for dualism and it's the problem that makes a lot of people down through the centuries philosophically opposed to dualism.
Let me ask, though, if there are any questions or comments. Do you guys all sort of understand the dualist view? Kind of, sort of? You see the interaction problem. How do the two parts interact? You don't see the problem? Um, if, you're, if you've got this non-physical aspect of you that is the soul, how does that non-physical aspect connect up to the physical? In fact, that's the problem, is how does it tell the physical what to do if it's not physical? Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, well, that's the question, right? So um, I believe that angels and demons exist. Um, I don't think that we have any evidence that they have real physical being. It seems to be spiritual being and maybe sometimes supernaturally in miraculous you know, events they can be given a temporary physical existence or something like that. So um, can they impact real world things? Good question. I think so. Um, but how? So I, I'm a theist. I believe God exists. I believe God, uh, at least at a certain point in his existence, assumed physical form, became a person, okay, which is a pretty wild view, actually. If you stop and, like, step back from, you know, the habituation that we have all gotten into of, you know, thinking of Jesus of Nazareth, if you think about God becoming a person, that's a pretty wild view, right? It's pretty crazy. So I hold that view. I believe God became a person. Um, but most of the time, throughout his existence, God is not a physical being. Okay, certainly God the Father is not physical. So how does God the Father do things in the world? Right, I mean, I think he does, but, um, you know, it's a mystery, right? How does the non-physical impact the physical? It's a mystery. Go ahead, Zayir. It's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, good question. So there have been a lot of people, not Christians, down through the centuries who have said, well, God is the universe. They've said the universe and God are one or something like that, right? It's a view that's common in Eastern religions. Um. Definitely, that view has a lot of problems, but it doesn't have the problem of how does a non-physical being interact with a physical universe. That's a problem that is unique to, to my religion, our, you know, our religion at, at HBU. Uh, how does, and that is uh, a religion that holds that God is different than the universe. God is someone who made the universe, but is not synonymous with the universe. So how does God impact the universe if God is different than the universe? That's the, a problem for, um, for the dualist view. Problem for all uh, views that hold that soul and body are, are different things, real, really existing different things. Okay, um, because of the problems with dualism, there has arisen down through the centuries a different view of what a uh, human being is. Again, we're answering the question, what is a human being? And that is monism. And monism comes in two varieties. Okay, the first variety is physicalism. Physicalism says we are just bodies. We are one thing, that's monism, and that one thing is bodies. We are just bodies. Um, so you're feeling that there's an aspect of you that is different than physical. That conscious feeling that you have where you think to yourself, you know, I know the table exists. The table doesn't know exist. it exists. That's a kind of a, a fiction that supervenes upon the physical, but you don't really have an aspect to you that is not physical on the physicalist view. You're just one thing, and that's body. Okay, most physicalists have tended to be hard-bitten atheist types who don't believe in a spiritual realm. Okay, but not all physicalists, just, just most. Okay, um, the problem with physicalism, quite obviously, 
is that we have these very strong first personal sensations that we have consciousness and that consciousness is a real thing. And that it is, it makes us different than the table we're sitting at. And it makes us different somehow than all these objects we see in the universe that don't seem to be animate and don't have conscious experiences. Okay, um, don't you guys just love like this deep abstract discussion right off the bat? It's like, let's just go deep immediately. It is philosophy class. <laughs> oh, we'll, we'll go, we'll go even deeper in a minute. We have not gone, we have not gone as deep as we will go today. Um, okay. <laughs> Uh, the other idealist view, I'm sorry, the other monist view is idealism. Buckle up your seatbelts. This is kind of weird. Idealism is the view that um, there is, that human beings are just one thing. But that one thing is not bodies. We're just minds. Okay, it is a consistent view. This could be the case. The idealists could be right. It is not a view that you could disprove. Uh, let me illustrate it for a second. Have you guys all seen the movie The Matrix? Some of us haven't seen The Matrix? It might be a little dated now. It's like mid-90s, I guess. So maybe it's a little dated. OK, OK, I'll, I'll uh, explain it. Um, I guess this isn't a spoiler alert. Or no, it is a spoiler alert for the first film, if I, if I explain what it is. At this point, I don't think it matters. <laughs> <laughs> in The Matrix, the it's an illusion. The world is an illusion. People's minds are plugged in to a matrix that gives them experiences of physical realities, but those physical realities are just mental experiences that are taking place within the matrix, which is this conscious illusion that has been created for them. You remember sort of now? Yeah. Okay, okay, cool. Um, all right, now, um, this could be the case. This is not solipsism. So this is not the view that, uh, you know, I'm the only one who exists and all of these other things I see around me are just figments of my imagination. Okay, this is not solipsism. This is not that view. This is the view that um, other minds do exist, lots of minds exist, but all that exist are minds, not bodies. Okay, uh, and it could be right. Um, it could be that all of this physical stuff we think we see around us is just actually conscious experiences. After all, you can never get outside of your mind to encounter the world as it is physically apart from the mind, can you? No, oh, man. No, 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 no. The answer is no. <laughs> you're cool, you're cool. <laughs> All right, uh, but the only way we can encounter the world is through the intermediary, the mind, right? That's the only way you can experience the world. You can't experience the world apart from your mind. So because of that, we don't have any proof that the real world physically, apart from our minds, has existence. Okay, um... Again, this is not my view, but it is a consistent view. This could be the case, but this is not my view. I don't. I don't think this. Is the, I don't think God would lie to us. Uh, and some like you know, think about it, right? If it's all just an illusion, then God's like creating some sort of massive fiction for us to think that the physical really exists when it doesn't. And you know, like the scriptures tell us that God's a truth teller, right? And and I believe uh, from theological tradition that God would tell us the truth. So why would he systematically lie to us? I don't know. Um, although it does solve the problem of how a non-physical being God uh, can interact with uh, the world. He's not actually interacting with a physical world on the idealist view. He's actually just uh, interacting with conscious experiences. Uh, okay, so if you struggle to believe the idealist view, if you think the idealist view is wrong, there are certain conundrums that you will have a problem resolving. Um, here's a famous philosophical conundrum. So if a tree falls in the forest and no one is there, does it make a sound? No, it does not. It does not make a sound, right? No, 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 no. It does not make a sound. If no one is there to experience it, there is no sound that is that occurs. Sound 
there, there's sound waves that go out from that because there's something to hear and it's the birds. Just because we're not there doesn't mean that it doesn't it, make sound. So by, by if no one is there, I mean no birds or conscious beings. No conscious beings are around. No conscious beings are around. It makes no sound. There is no sound that is made. No, 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 no. There is no sound. You have to have a, a conscious being receiving those sound waves, experiencing sound for there to be sound. Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> no, no, no. God's a conscious being, so God could hear himself talking to himself. Right, okay. But I, I have no idea, man. When God was incarnated in this world as Jesus of Nazareth, I think that he had ears. I'm not sure about the, like, normally. Okay, um, moving on. Okay, um. Are animals conscious beings? Yeah. Well, okay, so I'm saying no birds. No deer. No, no, no birds, no deer. No rabbits, no cats, no dogs. No sound. No sound. No, 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 no. There is, there, is no, there is no conscious experience of sound having occurred when no being is around to hear that tree. Okay, so it doesn't make a sound. It's silent. It is silent. There is no sound. Wait, no, no, no. It's not being, the sound isn't being perceived. But it's still happening. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's not what happening. About, what about that radio? So how is that happening? It is not. You can't. You can't. Uh, maybe sound waves could be measured, but there is no experience of sound. Oh, you know what? Actually, actually, if there is no conscious. I said conscious experience. There is no experience of sound. It, does, it doesn't occur. There is no sound. So if there's no experience, there is sound. Well, it's not experience. To have sound, you have to have a conscious rece receiver, a recipient of the sound waves. That is true. See, I got, I got one, I got one person on board with me there. <laughs> okay, so anyway, the idealists say it takes conscious experience, okay, for um, for this to happen, and the idealists say actually all that there is is just conscious experiences. So does that mean that that if there that uh, say like say there's no one on the east coast right now, there's no one there. Does that mean that the waves aren't crashing? Yeah. Um, by crashing, do you mean? Because they aren't cresting. They aren't. That the that the ocean just. Oh, those could be ha that could be happening. I mean, how do you know? You can't ask nobody. That could be happening, but um, you know but you don't know. No one's there. There's no experience of it. Yeah, you don't know that it's happening. It's not happening. You you it could be, but you don't know. So uh, on the idealist view, on the idealist view, if there is a tree in the middle of Australia, and no human being, no creature has ever encountered this tree. Isn't the middle of Australia the outback tree? Yes. Yes, and it doesn't have trees. I know. So their their illustration breaks down. So I, I'm aware of that. But let's assume there's a tree, right? Okay. Um, if there's a tree in the middle of Australia and nobody's encountered that tree, no conscious being has encountered that tree. Does that tree have real existence? No. Oh, yeah. It's still there. Nah, I mean, it, it, it doesn't matter if no one has seen it. it that is denied that it's not there. Just because. But nobody's seen it. That it, it comes to have there. existence on the idealist view when a conscious, it's conscious it's being encounters it. That is when it comes to have existence. If you think about it, well, then nobody can prove the existence of that tree if it's never seen. <laughs> Why do we need to prove it for it to exist? Well, once you encounter it, you've proved its existence. But before you encountered it, it didn't exist. Yeah, why, why does everything revolve around us? Because we're the only conscious beings. Like, like conscious, it takes conscious beings to give a real meaning to the experience. Actually, I think it's, I don't think it revolves Well, us and other conscious beings. That's another conscious God, being. God still knows it's there, so technically... Great, and so on the idealist view, that tree exists if it is in the mind of God. Okay, if God contemplates that tree, that gives that tree existence on the idealist view. Well, with respect to us, no, it doesn't exist. So, yeah. <laughs> with respect to us, I'm talking about. I'm talking about if, if God knows the tree exists, then the tree exists because God is conscious being. Yeah. Suppose God doesn't exist, though. Okay? Suppose God doesn't exist, and suppose no conscious being's ever seen the tree. Okay?
Okay, so no, no divine mind encounters it. No conscious being has ever seen the tree. The tree doesn't exist. Yeah. You don't know the tree. I've never seen the tree, so I don't know about the tree. So therefore, it doesn't exist in my Once you begin to encounter it, it exists. Exactly. To me, but... And the only, the only thing that added to it is Okay. All right, all right, all right. Um... Now, uh, again, my big beef with the idealist view is uh, if that is the case, then it's all an illusion of physical. There's no, like, real physical stuff. And for that reason, I find that view pretty crazy, right? It could be the case. It could. It's a consistent view. We could all be in the matrix. Our minds could be all plugged into the matrix. But I find this view pretty crazy because it leads to some paradoxical assertions about the nature of God and about the nature of the world around me. It's all, like, this doesn't have real existence apart from my experience. Is it paradoxical if you don't believe in God? You still have to believe that this is all an illusion of the physical. Uh, yeah, so actually, so, one, one, one quick word on this. The quantum physicists, the people who have really drilled down into the microparticles that constitute the, you know, the core fundamentals of, uh, of our universe, the more they drill into this stuff, the less it seems to have tangible physical nature to it, and the more they become idealists. A bunch of the quantum physicists are actually idealists because they say once you drill down into the very tiny fundamental microparticles, it's not physical anymore. You can't speak in terms of the physical. Um, it's more like, uh, it's more like waves. Um, so light comes in waves and particles, right? It's waves and particles simultaneously. Um, but the only way it can be, uh, the only way you can speak intelligibly of microparticles is in terms of waves that are mathematically describable. Oh yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, but it, uh, the atomic uh, atomic physicists, the people who've really drilled down into the quanta level of uh, of atomic nature, um, they tend to be idealists. It's kind of weird. Okay, um, let's take a quick break, and then we will come back and we will uh, ask an even deeper question. Okay, we will go deeper. All right, let's take a quick break.